Uh, Psalms chapter 4, starting with the third verse. But know that the Lord, God, uh, the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord and will hear when, he, when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your heart, your own heart, upon your bed, and be still. Offer the sacrifices of, uh, of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. So, first of all, we notice that God sets apart the godly. He never intended for the godly to be interspersed and intermixed with uh, as undistinguishable from the rest of society. He has taken and set us apart. And He listens when we call. He hears our prayers. It's not this indistinct, well, maybe God hears me or maybe He doesn't. No, God listens to His people. But to truly have an effect, to truly see success, we have, to, we have to do our part, which is the sacrifices of righteousness. We have to be living a righteous life. We have to be where we should be with God. And we have to trust Him. Place our entire trust in God. Amen. Now, trust is an interesting thing. If you're not used to trusting, it's hard to trust. <coughs> So the more you do it, the better you get. If you don't trust God, and you know, it's real easy for people to fall into relying on themselves instead of God. It's hard to take and turn, it, uh, turn things over to Him and let Him have it once you're used to doing it all yourself. I've heard many people quote Benjamin Franklin like he was the, like he was the Bible. And I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard people go through and say, well, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. No, it doesn't. God never once says God helps those who help themselves. On the contrary, God says, throw your petitions upon the Lord. Amen. Rely upon the Lord. Stand with the Lord. Trust in the Lord. The Bible teaches God reliance, not self reliance. Amen. Now, it also doesn't teach government reliance. In many ways, the government has stepped in and have tried to usurp the position of both God and the church. And a lot of it's because. Ungo of God, ungodly people being elected. But when it comes down to the, the basis, God wants us to trust in Him and not in other things. Amen. God wants us to be God-reliant people, to take and depend upon the Lord. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse, start on verse 6. That's Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So rather than worrying about things, God wants us to give it to Him. He wants us to take that treasure chest in our hearts of all our worries, of all our concerns, of everything that bothers us, and open it up and hand it to Him. Amen. He does not want us to sit there and fester on things that, on tomorrow's problems. He doesn't want us to take in trying to figure it out for ourselves in many ways. 
He wants us to rely on Him. We have concerns, take them to Him. Amen. Give them to Him. Then trust Him to come up with the best solution to the problem. Now, I personally have noticed that when you start worrying, you normally are worrying about things that don't happen. Very rarely do we worry about things that actually do happen. And if they do happen, they normally don't happen to the degree we're worried about. So it's better just to trust God to give us what we need to handle the situation when it occurs. Amen. And that way, we don't have to sit there and take all this energy. And it does take a lot of energy to worry. They can better be used in other areas in our lives. We, we don't have to use that energy for worry. Now, worry has a very interesting effect on humans. It raises your blood pressure. It eats away at the stomach lining of your stomach. It affects your vision. It affects your nervous system. It, it, it affects your breathing. It shortens your lifespan. There's a lot to be said for getting rid of that word. To get rid, to take and turn it over and let it and let God have it. Just give it to him. Once you learn to trust God and hand it over everything over to him, life is a lot more easy to deal with. There's less struggles. Then we can just struggle on taking and doing what He wants us to do and living the way He wants us to live. And we don't have to worry about all this extra nonsense. I've often said, I learned a long time ago, not to worry about anything that I have no control over. If I have no control over it in the first place, why worry about it? Just hand it over to God and let Him deal with it. He's the only one that can in the first place. Let us turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start with the 24th verse. In Matthew chapter 6. <coughs> That's Matthew chapter 6, starting with the 24th verse. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat and what ye shall drink, nor yet for the body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, uh, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed in like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field that today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. So if we seek God's kingdom first, 
we seek to be His people, we seek to take and do His service, if we seek to be what He would have us be, to seek His righteousness and actually live a righteous and holy life today, we, He will take care of us and we have no need to worry about our needs. He will supply them. Amen. So it is important that we take and place God first. Amen. And if we have God placed first, then He will take care of all the little things. And I'm about to fall off this. God knows what is important. You know, my dad pastored for a while in a place called Farmington, Farmington New Mexico. And in Farmington, New Mexico... The culture of the people was a little different than what we were used to. A large percentage of the congregation were, was Navajo Indians. And we had people at the house all the time, constantly. And it was never sit down and just the family eat. It was always the family plus half the congregation. And my dad one day sat down and went through and calculated up all the money that was coming in and all the money that was going out and found out that he was spending about twice what was coming in, yet the bank account never dropped. Amen. God supplies if we seek His kingdom first and trust Him. Amen. But we have to place Him first. We, when we go to Him in prayer, we have to believe He's going to answer. He's going to be doing something. He's not just sitting back in heaven, letting everything flow by and just ignoring us. He cares. And He's going to take an action. Amen. He knows what we need. One problem is a lot of times we confuse what we need for what we want. Humans want something all the time. That's the way we are. But we don't need everything we want. And in many cases we have to say no to our wants and desires because God's provided us for the need and we're using them for our wants. That's our fault. That's not God's fault. It is important that we take what God gives us and use it properly. So that we take, and take that blessing that He gives us, take that supply, And use it in the right way first. Now that doesn't mean God doesn't occasionally let us have some of our wants. But He wants us to take care of the needs before we take care of the wants. I've noticed, and I'm going to pick on the younger generation mainly because they are so easy to pick on. I could pick on some of the older generation if I wanted to, because y'all are fairly easy too. <laughs> but, uh, you find that I have seen people under 30 who spend money for things and games before they spend money on food. Honestly, is a game worth going hungry? Not I don't me. think so. Not to me. <laughs> Yet, their priorities are turned upside down. Now I can go through and pick out various other things that other people's priorities are messed up with too. Our society has taken and gotten all jumbled up in its priorities. It used to be 
that people had to take and keep their priorities straight. But even the poorest among us have luxuries that many countries don't have. I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't have a phone. And many of them have phones like this one that you can carry around in your pocket. Some people have multiple phones. Would you believe that's a luxury? There was a great deal of time my grandparents didn't even have a phone. Or if they did have a phone, it was a party line. You had to wait for your right ring before you could pick it up. Otherwise, you'd be listening on to everybody else's phone calls. You shared the line. My great granddad, well, let's go down closer. My granddad on my mother's side spent most of his childhood, in fact, all my grandparents spent most of their childhood going to and fro on horse and buggy. My grandmother tells about the, the, the first time she ever saw a car at 12 years old. Think about that for a second. My grandparents, that's not that far back. And yet, except for the younger generation who don't want to go out and buy vehicles for some reason, <laughs> the vast majority of Americans have multiple cars. And if you live in anything but a big city, you pretty much have to have some kind of vehicle to get back and forth to work. It's, it's a must. And if you live out of town, it's even more of a must. And yet, we take it for granted. Because we could be in a horse and buggy. Have to plan out your day because you're not going to go much more than 20 miles a, a, a day unless you've got a really good horse. I have heard of some going as much as 100, but that's the odd one, not the normal. So when we come down to the, um, our lives, we need to understand God is blessing us. Amen. He's blessing us constantly. But he expects us to trust him and rely on him and then use what he gives us appropriately. Be good stewards of, his, of what he gives us. So as good stewards, we cannot be self-reliant. We have to be God-reliant because God wants us to use things in a specific way. Sometimes he'll tell us to give something to someone. And we need to have the material that he already has given us so we can do it. And if we have not taken and gone through and been good stewards, we won't have it. Don't worry about the little things. Don't worry about the big things either. <laughs> Trust God. Let Him provide. Amen. Now that doesn't mean don't work. There's an element of our, our society that thinks that, well, if you trust God, you don't have to work. The Bible says, he that doesn't work shouldn't eat. Think about that for a second. If we, if the Bible's telling us if we don't work, we don't eat, we better work. It's just that, that simple. 
God wants us to be productive people. He wants us to be productive people in society and productive people in the church. Amen. Like I said before, God never called anybody to be a pew warmer. God never called anybody to sit back and do nothing. He's called us all to an active, productive life. Now, that productive life may be different depending on our age and our physical health and what God has called us to do. But it will still be doing something. Even if you can't do anything else, you can still pray. Amen. And that's really one of the best things you can do in the first place. If you truly believe, prayer is one of the most effective things you can do. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9, starting with the first verse. That's Luke chapter 9, starting with the first verse. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither, uh, neither staves, nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither to, uh, have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when ye go out of that, of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went from town and through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, were they in need? No, God provided. They didn't bring anything with them except the basics. And God provided everything. We take and underrate and underestimate God. God wants us to be totally dependent. Here he's teaching his disciples to be totally God-reliant. Amen. Don't take anything with you. Go out and do it. <coughs> they were forced into a position where they had to rely on God. There was a, co a, a college, Bible college up in Scotland that required all the ministerial students <coughs> to take and go out into another town with nothing. They sent them out in a small group. And they were to come up with food, clothing, and a means to minister to the people locally. And they weren't allowed to bring anything, and they weren't allowed to work. Their work had to be focused on ministry. And they had to do it for a month. If they couldn't do it for a month, they didn't graduate. Think about that for a second. They were asking him to do what Jesus was asking the apostles to do. Go and rely on God. Trust Him. Now, the report I read from somebody who did it said that not only did God provide them a place to stay, the place they stayed was big enough for them to have meetings in, <coughs> and that the it, when they were trying to decide how to get people into the meetings, they decided, well, what we need is to uh, have uh, invite people to tea. But how can we invite people to tea? We have no cake. I would have thought the first thing you would need is tea. <laughs> but apparently they had tea somehow. I guess tea is pretty easy to get given to you when you are in Britain. 
but they, uh, they took and scheduled a time for the meeting. They invited people to tea. They had many confirmed that they were coming to the tea. They had no cake. They prayed about it repeatedly and often and fervently. And it came down to the day of the meeting. And a cake came in the mail. Amen. But they didn't ask for one. They never told anybody about what their plans were. A cake came in the mail. God provided. Amen. Oftentimes, we go through and do a lot of planning, but we have not learned to rely on God. And when we haven't learned to rely on God and we start planning, we plan things for is within our strength to do it. And God wants us to plan things according to what it, His strength is to do it. That's a different limiting factor. If I plan things according to my strength, I am a limited being. I can't do a lot of things. But if I take and plan things according to God's strength, He can do anything and He has no limitations. Amen. We need to plan things according to God's strength and rely on Him. But to do that, we have to learn to rely on Him. And you start with the little things first. You trust God for your daily needs. And then when He provides those, then you trust Him more. You trust God for healing. And when He provides healing, you trust Him more. Every time you rely on Him and you trust Him and He supplies, and you realize this is God working, it gives you the ability to rely on Him more. It opens up your mind and starts seeing the big picture. That truly there is nothing that is impossible for God. I was talking to a person recently that they told me that they had a heart attack years ago. And at the time of the heart attack, the heart attack made it where they couldn't work. They were in a they were actually a farmer, so they, they were limited. If they didn't work, there was no crop. And if there was no crop, there was no income. And they, and they owed massive amounts of debt to Uncle Sam. And if you know anything about Uncle Sam and the IRS, they are the most least forgiving of any debt holder you could possibly have. They don't take and say, well, this person will work with them. No. <laughs> it's, we're going to take everything you've got and then some. But he owed a massive amount of debt to the IRS. Well, he prayed about it. And God started sending him funds from all over the country. Within a year, not only did God supply the need for him to live on, him and his family to live on, he, God also paid off that debt to the IRS. Within a year. With him being down from a heart attack and unable to work. God moves if we let Him. Amen. But we have to rely on Him. If He had to sit there and said, well, I can't do it, therefore it can't be done, it wouldn't have got done. He said He was getting money from people He'd never heard of in His entire life. He didn't know them. How they found out about His need, He didn't have a clue. God had to have told them. And yet, here they were, sending in money. 
They carried him through that time of where he needed to recover and helped him get out of the mess he had already gotten himself into when he was healthy. God will supply if we let Him. Amen. But we have to take it to Him in prayer, give it to Him, trust Him, and rely on Him. Amen. That letting Him take the problem and not rely on ourselves. 